Drew was talking about wanting to, oh, maybe he doesn't want to come on though. He's setting up to do PVT meta material. So. Uh, I can't tell if this microphone's live or not. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Drew. Okay, um, wasn't sure. Here, um, let me th- remove, I'll, I'll remove the spotlight. There we go. Now, now when you talk, it should show you. Oh, okay. Um, well, this is all very interesting and, and magnetics and spinny things and like that. Um, our thrust production is all static. Um, it has no ferrous material in it. Um, you know, we're making multiple millinewtons of thrust on micro watts of power. So uh, I can't talk to any of the all this super high power stuff y'all are talking about. But the metamaterials is extremely interesting to me because um, we're looking to reduce the permutivity of um, our coatings on no some of our plates. Okay. So right now we're using vacuum, which gets us a one, but um, we'd love to go to a stacked uh, operation. So my, my, our, 100% of my, th- of my attention right now is trying to figure out some clever um, coating, some type of some metamaterial, whatever, in order to drop uh, the permeativity of the, um, the, the metallic plates in our stack down below, or at least down to one um, without graph or without vacuum. Um, so that's the big thing. So is anybody out there doing anything like that? Uh, zinc oxide, I read an article that zinc oxide becomes a super, uh, a, a super resistor, a super insulator at cryogenic temperatures. Yeah, I, I saw that too. Um, I don't want to screw around with cryo. In, in the book, in this book. Um, yeah, I just ordered that book. I hadn't seen that one before. Moo negative. They talk about MNG, moo negative materials. You have like du- double negative and single negative materials, but the um, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert. I just barely got the book and I need to lock myself in a room. But what you're talking about with affecting the permeability, permittivity is, uh, I think they're classified as like moo negative, uh, think like moo metal. Yeah, that sounds exciting. Um, and what I've seen in here is that they're using it, it is layers, um, like with the, the bismuth and, and uh, magnesium layers. Um, so they're, they're using, basically you'll have four layers it, of your metamaterial, and then uh, you know, you'll just stack that up on top of each other in order to get uh, either something that's structurally sound or the, the right uh, frequency correction. The, the right waveform correction through the material. So it's, it's a multi-step process, which, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I haven't found the, the direct connection. You know, my brain's working on it. So it's just, we've been busy getting the damn room built and living life. So, um, but yeah, let's mo- look up moo negative. Mu negative materials. Mu, like. Uh, That's like that uh, zero magnetic material, uh, mu, uh, mu metal or mu metal or. Right something. there you go, but it's it's going to be some sort of multi-layered laminate that you're you're going to want. Um, the book walks you through some parts of that and like learning your layers. Um, you know, spin the spin structure of the metals that you're working on, like it's uh, going to be important as well, like uh, how well it polarizes. Uh, you know, most things are spin one half, but um, like magnesium and aluminum are like, what is it, three eighths or five eighths. Um, so they, they uh, polarize differently. So is that what sets up the permeativity? I believe so. It's like the spin characteristics of the metal and how it how it's handling how electricity goes through it. Okay. Yeah, I'm the engineering side of our uh, equation. I can mad rocket scientist uh, genius on the other side of it. And uh, okay. I just you know I heard y'all talking about uh, vapor deposition and then I've got something very similar to the thing you got in the background there. Yeah, it's uh, it's a dense. I mean, that's about six inch diameter platter. Yeah. Um, where'd you go, Mark? 
Right. So we've got part of the machinery outside. You may be checking on that. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> thermal management is the next step, like because it's adding a lot of heat um, into the building. So. Um, yeah, just running all the fans in a well basically you have a clean work area but just running all the fans in a clean work area adds heat to the load because all you're doing yep. is compressing the air basically but um you yeah. know if your if your goal is to try and knock down particle count well we've got two you can't see them there's two filters up on the top and then there's another filter inside of the ac unit um so i mean i wanted to put another one inside uh inside of the baffles as well uh and then you know it is positive ventilation so it's um you know, right here it's, you know, it's forcing stuff out um, yeah you're, you're you're probably better off just setting up a, a massive uh, clean bubble over the area you care about and just okay. fit just forcing hepa filtered air because uh you you'd need a hundred times as much filtration as you got to clean that room up right uh, yeah i've been saying that we probably need more filters on it so and they need to be hepa or you know the uh, next generation the, yeah the, yeah so it's we'll take yeah, it's very 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 expensive to you know get clean um clean workbenches work well and like i said uh forced hepa filter air is probably your best effect just keep a steady stream of clean air moving over your uh whatever you think is important it's a good point yeah, the, uh, the first clean room I was associated with or helped set up was at uh, UNM in their, uh, it's called Cosmiac. Uh, it's their growing aerospace college, but the, uh, it was a, a hand-me-down from uh, one of the AFRL directorates on Sandia. Um, it was pretty simple. Like, it was mainly just, you know, a roof and four four corners and they had uh hanging curtains for most of it and then a you know sticky tape on the inside and so we're making cube sets uh it would be a clean work area so yeah <laughs> on this one i tried to get it as sealed you know the goal was to have it completely sealed and like if you don't have air flowing into it you like after a while you just pass out and fall asleep but um are you planning on wearing smocks or bunny suits or yeah, booties? Yeah, and... smocks. We've got, um, you know, the, the start of it. The this this goes on the ground on the antechamber, the, the sally port. Uh, we have the curtains here. We're, they're very smelly, so we've been uh, leaving them outside. Um, you know, I think, you know, I pulled, I brought them in because we might get some rain, but over the next week, it looks like the forecast is uh, okay. So I'm just going to keep them outside and let, try to get as much of the smell out of them as possible. Let some UV radiation uh, harden the polymers in it a bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, our one of Tom, uh, Mark's um, contacts said that anything that's plastic, like, you know, that's going to leave a volatile organic chemical or a VOC compound. compound. There you go. A VOC somewhere in there. So, um, well, yeah, you've, you've got no hope of uh, <laughs> keeping your NVR levels down to anything reasonable. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's always cleaning. You just precision clean. Um, well, acid depending. washes are going to be the next step. So we've got some, you know, personal, uh, some PPE equipment. Um, so we'll have to do the acid washes in that and then put it into a, you know, something that's got forced air and it's HEPA filtered on it um, and then get it into the, the machine as quick as possible. So we're, we're, uh, we're, we're working lean and quick in order to get- yeah, Reagent grade I, uh, um, IPA, um, and I mean reagent grade, like uh, from Fisher, uh, you know, $40 a, a gallon stuff in the bottle. Okay. Um, that's 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 your good that's a friend um then there's always the fluoro solvents um so what how is that how is that called again reagent reaging it's reagent grade so when you when you contact 
somebody like uh, I don't know, Bruin Holding Company or Fisher Scientific, you just look for the expensive stuff, the reagent grade. Um, and I mean, you know, you can use methanol or if you, you want to take a hit on it once in a while or just IPA, it's a little cheaper. Um, but it has it has a NVR, you know, sub one, uh, sub one milligram per deciliter or whatever it is. Um, so that's that stuff doesn't have nothing in it. It, it actually is clean. Um, this stuff you buy at Walmart, the 91% alcohol is garbage. Yeah. I know. Um, there's nothing know. you can do with it. The well, stuff you buy at the hardware store is garbage. There's nothing you can do with it. I was telling Mark that, like all the stuff that was yeah. commercially available. Yeah, even stuff. if you buy the acetone, you want to buy reagent grade everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, get ready to spend 40 to 150 bucks a gallon for it. Uh, Drew, what are you uh, building metamaterials for? Uh, we're hoping to take our propulsion system to the next level. Right now we're in the one to 100 millinewton range, but we want to jump to the, uh, the Newton class. So we need the metamaterials to do exactly what you're doing, you know, try and reverse engineer the, the magical you know, UFO skin. Um, we actually understand what's going on, but the trick is to actually make a little bit of that stuff so we can play with it. Um, Cause our physics uh, fully explains um, what's going on. So the trick who's, is to just get, get a hold of some of the stuff. Who, who's the hour in our physics? Uh, the other guy in it is uh, Dr. Charles Bueller. He was on a couple of weeks ago. You're, you're, so you're working with Charles Bueller? <laughs> it's the other way around. He works with me, but yes. Ah, okay. We're a okay. team. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I'm glad that you guys finally made it back. I've been bugging Charlie for a presentation, so. Yeah, we're trying to decide on whether we want to do that or not. Well, and that, that's up to you, sir. And, you know, it doesn't yeah. have to be about your primary area of research. Most folks have lots and lots of projects. So if you have something else that you want to present on, you know, uh, I mean, this is kind of our community forum, right? That's, that, that, that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a forum for everyone in this community to share and collaborate. Yeah, well, pretty much um, we've shut every other thing down. I mean, I used to build telescope mirrors and uh, underwater vision systems. And I didn't, no, just you, you have no idea. Um, but uh, everything is shut, shut down for the propulsion system. So because it sucks up 100% of the time. In fact, there's the, the, it's operating right now on, out in the shop. Um, but this was such an interesting you know, discussion. I decided to listen in and put the test on hold. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Well, again, we, you know, we had a few folks who were kind of disruptive and, and that, that kind of grew over time. And so it's, it's a difficult decision to boot people from, I, I think, any venue, but especially from one as open as ours. But um, we did that and things, I, I would say this week, last week, somewhat this week, definitely things are kind of getting back to normal. We're getting more focused on track. You know, I mean, this is a hardcore, intense audience. And so it helps to let people be able to focus without a lot of the distractions. Yeah, I'm I'm totally stoked about the the uh, that there's somebody else out there um, trying to build metamaterials and trying to uh, induce changes in uh, permeativity um, in the skins of the materials um, via RF. And I don't know anything about RF; it, it all terrifies me. Um, I don't like electricity at all. Um, but it's the future. It's definitely the direction. Um, I have no no comment on the whole cloaking or you know, whatever stuff. I don't, I don't think any of that's part of anything I'm ever going to work on. Um, uh, Drew, you know, does your system not involve RF at all? Not at all. No, we're pure, uh, we're pure DC. Um, but we understand that if when that in order to change the permeativity of these metamaterials that we are going to have to go AC and there are AC components of our physics. Um, but it, our physics works well right now in DC. And it, and it draws so little power. And in fact, turning it off is the biggest problem. You lock the stupid thing up and it stays running for you know weeks on end. So Oh, because, yeah, because there's enough charge built up that it trickles yeah. through. Yeah. yeah, we're building really nice electrodes. Um, and, uh, you know, you can build an amazing electric um, with, the, with the most basic of materials. So uh, that's the problem. And uh, that's why we're moving to the next major step, um, which is uh, building uh, a 
a variable permeativity surface. That's that's but and then the only way you're going to do that is with some sort of RF modulation and you know whatever. I, I'm not sure. I'm sure there's some magic in there somewhere that I'm never going to understand. But I don't have to. I just have to build the RF system the way uh, Dr. Bueller says to build it, and you know usually they end up working. So. But yeah, I'm stoked that y'all got, you know, I've got a, I got a clean room that looks you know, similar to that. Um, I got, I got rid of my Zoom shirt. Now I'm wearing my normal. Yeah. I feel much more comfy now. It's just a cheapo <laughs> Abercrombie shirt. <laughs> um, well, I try and dress up a little bit. Although somebody said the other day, they're like, are you trying to copy Lex Friedman? And I looked at his website and he wears a suit and tie for everything. And I'm like, damn it, that was what I was going for. But now I got to change it. Then I asked Mark, I said, I said on my website, I was like, what if I do a black and white American flag? And he's like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. He's like, it's surrounded by hate. I'm like, oh, come on, man. There goes all the good ideas. So yeah. Drew, you're using high voltage DC. Yep. And where, how are you differentiating uh, ion wind or uh, static attraction from thrust? Oh, I don't. <laughs> for, uh, I run the whole thing at uh, ten to the minus six tor. The whole thing's in a vacuum chamber inside of a, a, a fully a full a full Gaussian shield. Um, every everything you can think of, and some things you haven't. Um, we've already taken into account and. Typical test is uh, 10 to the minus six, you know, five times 10 to the minus six um, vacuum chamber. It's all suspended. It's run on a digital uh, force meter. Oh, I see a gravity capacitor on your shelf too. But up um, the... a what? Yeah, uh, uh, up, up on your shelf, Drew. I see. A, I see on the very top left. Um, uh, no, other other side. Other side. It looks like a big pancake. That thing. Yeah, gravity capacitor, no. right? <laughs> no, that's well. Thank you. That's very clever. Uh, no, that's. I'm sorry. That's. Uh, I, I did Society for Creative Anachronism for you know 25 years, and uh, I used to build uh, lathes or not. I'm sorry. I used to build uh, um, vintage telescopes. So that's a copy oh. of a 1610 telescope that I created for it. Um, that's the. Uh, that was a, that was the Hubble Space Telescope of its day. If you lived at six, in 1610. Um, no, I, I've, electrostatic repulsion would work in a vacuum. Yes. So it works how, for perfectly. Yeah, I know it does. Uh, how would you? How are you differentiating electrostatic repulsion or attraction from thrust? All right. One more time. How are you differentiating electrostatic repulsion or attraction from thrust in a vacuum? Uh, basically, the entire test cell, which is, uh, I don't know, they're about this big. Um, the entire test cell is itself suspended with nothing around it. And that's tied to a, a digital force meter. So it doesn't really go anywhere. It just pulls against a little tiny force meter. Um, so when you say electrostatic attraction, um, we start with, first of all, the entire box is ITO, so you can, transparent, you can look inside it. Um, that whole thing is grounded to the shell of the vacuum chamber, so there's nothing going out of that box, that's for damn sure. And then the test articles themselves start with negative plates, and then there's a couple of magical things in the middle, and it ends at a negative plate. So the entire sandwich is literally sandwiched in ground. Now, we pass that ground because we actually want to measure how much charge is going in and out of this toy. We pass that down through a very sensitive um, uh, current meter. Um, so, and then it just goes right to, sh to shield ground. So everything in the entire article is tied to shield ground. Some things pass through a meter before they get there, but it, it's not important. Um, so yeah, we don't have a electrostatic attraction problem. Uh, how many volts are we talking about? What's your potential? Any kilovolts or? Yeah, a couple of kilovolts. Yeah, three, three and a half, four. Uh, we were down from 150. That's what we started at a couple of years ago. We were at 150 kV, and um, that was ridiculously, stupidly dangerous. And now we're down to about uh, three. But we're headed down into the 100, 150, 250, 350 volt range. Um, we just need yeah, to this, this higher... shrink the, the, the spacing between them.
you ever you ever get zapped when you were working with the higher voltages? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I found out the hard way that you want to have the ITO on the inside, not the outside of your uh, containment box. Yeah, I used to. I, I, yeah. I, I, I used to do lifters all the time. I used to oh, I love lifters. Time. They were so much fun. But I used to get bit. Yeah. And, you know, the and then time. little little stuff, right? Like little stuff like you wouldn't think mm -hmm. of. Like, uh, oh, you know, you, you when you're at the higher voltages, like um, you use a wooden stick to poke it. and But if the wooden stick, e even so even if the stick seems dry, if there's mm -hmm. enough moisture inside of it, it conducts. And so... So, you know, you have the stick out and it's like the same stick in summer, you're fine. You could move it around. But then in <laughs> winter, you know, it's like and you get zapped, you know, there's that. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, the little things pick up charge, too. That was one of the and we noticed some anomalies with that. But little things. So like my bench vice, I, you know, I, I'd walk by my bench vice wasn't connected to anything. It wasn't even near anything. But with those ions flowing through the air for some mm -hmm. reason and they would you know and i get a zap from stuff like that so yeah well we've uh we got it down to an art now i i we we fire this thing up literally every day um so it's there's there's far less time that it's not running than it is running it runs every day all day and it, have you noticed yeah. anything weird have you noticed any weird anomalies yeah yeah, yeah i could fill a I, I fill up one of these about every two weeks and uh I'd say half the pages don't make any sense to me. We saw, I, I, I can only, I, this is going back 20 years, right? But I was doing lifters every, every day in my garage. And, and I used a variety of power sources, but we'll say 30,000 30, up to 150,000 or more pulse DC um, using a flyback sawtooth off a of Mark's generator. And, <clears throat> or using a sawtooth waveform off a of flyback power Mark's generator. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of our stuff was heavy duty, custom built by Information Unlimited, you know, at the time. So it was yeah, bigger Bob. than that. Yeah, that's where all my toys came from. Yeah, from Bob. Yeah, mm. I, I love Bob. And and uh, and so one day, you know, I don't want to distract too much, but I, I was in just Yahoo, Yahoo groups, right? Everybody was in Yahoo groups at the time. And somebody mentioned something about... They were like, you notice any weird anomalies? And and I, I think I mentioned, yeah, I've seen some weird stuff, you know. And and it was like, then people were really, you could tell people were being hesitant, and people start talking about stuff. And and so one of the things that I found was um, a time anomaly. I, I I don't know why. It's hard to explain now, but like, uh, okay, you know, you get a feel for your equipment, right? We would run these things every day. And then you turn them off, you let everything dissipate. My entire setup, my entire system would dissipate typically in about 10 minutes, you know? And that's not a problem because if you're running and you're building and you're testing these things, you get done at the end of the day, you go in, you eat dinner, you're gone for two hours or something. What I noticed was I would come back down to the garage the next morning, I, you know, before I even plugged anything in and I would get shocks from these things. And, and it was like, well, wait a minute, why there's, there's nothing going on here. Everything should have dissipated. Why is there still high voltage here? You know? And so we, we noticed stuff like that. There, yeah, there were a ton of little ones. There was also a, a an inertial, I isn't a good way to describe it. The there's, inertia didn't behave right. What you want to do, you want, you want to get Dr. Bueller and Charlie um, to come on and talk about his, you know, ketchup on the French fries doesn't hide the salt or something he's got some he's got an analogy for everything because nothing he ever talks about makes any sense so but you want to have him spend about 30 minutes giving everybody a primer in electrostatics because then it will terrify you to your soul um you can put a lethal charge on a ground plate and you just you wouldn't believe it that you can actually put a lethal charge on a plate that is tied to ground you can put a lethal charge on a plate that is isolated in space. And oh, you yeah. Put a lethal charge on a plate that's tied to high voltage. It is terrifying how you can pack up charge on matter. And I personally, although no one else seems to believe me, I personally believe that um, 
because I know our propulsion system works fine and it produces far, 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 like orders of magnitude more thrust than could be explained by any of the fringe effects. Um, so I personally believe it's time dilation. It's identical in my book to gravity. So I believe that we are, it, that the field that we're generating, the electrostatic field that we're generating is dilating time, much like matter in space dilates time and that's what we call gravity. Um, so I think this is all very exciting and this has been a big weekend for us because we you know, doubled the thrust this weekend, but um, that's not important. Um, I, so, I would say, see, I think you're on to, based on what I've personally seen, right? You know, and I, I never figured it out. And the, the folks I was talking with online and back then, we never figured it out. We just kind of chalked it up in our anomalies book. But yeah, no, I know was, it's getting way some... off topic. But you know, if y'all want to have a discussion on on time dilation, I got some, I got some, you know, engineering observations um, that certainly fit all the known pieces of the puzzle. There was some time. Uh, yeah, I, I felt like time was being affected. I just never had a good idea, you know, and, and we noticed some other stuff too, inertial stuff, um, uh, rotation. So I mean, we had a couple experiments. We had one where, uh, so th the other thing was with the lifters, the lifters were tied down, right? But you use like a string mm -hmm. or you'd use like a, a piece of wood and, and you many could, a lifter. Yeah. You know, and you many. could touch the tethers, right? And, mm -hmm. and you, so, so one of the things that I noticed was um, they, they resist an external force. And, and a good example is um, if you fly them outside, especially if they're bigger, you fly them outside and a wind comes up, these things are so lightweight and the thrust is all down, you would expect the wind is just going to blow it, but they actually fight the wind. And, and so they also fight rotation. And so Savoir did an experiment where uh, he took a lifter in a completely sealed container, right? And he had the the, the, uh, the power supply was on gimbals. So he rotated this thing up. He got it going to about 20 RPM. He was blowing, he was blowing sideways on the entire enclosure with a fan to spin it up, right? So he, he spins this lifter up to, I think, about 20 RPM. It's going around at a pretty good clip. And you know, in, he had a couple of these. In the first one, he, he turns the fan off and it just keeps going and gradually slows down to a stop. So then he does the same experiment. He spins it up. It's about 20 RPM. It's going around. He turns the lifter on and it self-stabilizes and stops, even though it's in a completely sealed container. Hmm. Yeah. And it was like, well, how does that happen? In fact, somebody in the conference asked me about that last month. And I think I sent it to him. It was an old Windows media clip from like 2001 or something. Yeah. And, you know, and I saw the same thing. It was, the, it was almost like they would reject an externally applied inertial force. Yeah. The problem with lifters is there's an awful lot of high energy going on. You, you've got highly charged uh you know, wires and components and whatever. So you've got, you got ions flying around. It's just so much, you know, the earth's magnetic field can screw with it. Um, local magnetic fields. I mean, it's just, an, an, you know, whatever. You put it all in a vacuum yeah. chamber and all the nonsense goes away. And, and then, then you don't have to worry about being that's, called that's ion kinda, wind anymore. Yeah. Well, and in my case, I moved on to interviewing folks like yourself, but, you know, but then for, for people like for people like Mark who's building stuff, I, I will say, man, don't even mess with lifters. You know, that's no. it's been done. It, it, it was fun because it was nothing else. Um, that's where I started on this. Uh, I gave up on NASA ever getting I mean, off their I'm butts. Gonna, and... We're going to do a lifter for my kids' uh, fifth grade science fair. So uh, Yeah, that's fun. That's, it, uh, that's as, as long as you don't fun. electrocute the kids, that's the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll it's have, not worth we'll the hassle. Put ticker tape around it. Uh, I wanted yeah. to ask you, Drew, uh, does your technology... Uh, uh, correlate in any way to the gravitator from T.T. Brown, where he had parallel plate capacitor and various uh, dielectrics? Hmm. Yeah, actually, I guess it could. Um, you know, he was operating at a million volts, so there's really no telling what the hell he was doing. I think 70,000 uh, for that. That's what he said. Uh, That's paper. That doesn't that go to what what David was saying about sing David? Weren't you saying singularity is the you you were saying singularity is the limit? You, you were saying singularity is the limit to the energy density or something like that. And I've Schwinger. I've heard variations Schwinger. on that. Swinger limit. 
Schwinger limit. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's that's what I was talking about. Point of singularity, you know, the 26.1 million billion watts of power and across space-time metric um, and the entangled particle relationship. Uh, one thing I was gonna add, I, I wanted to comment on, uh, with the fields that you're getting with the subsequent charges being not dissipated, have you ever thought of using a deep earth ground rod? Most people who have grounded facilities, they're not really grounded. Like here in Nebraska, there's a 40 ohm resistance at the circuit. Go down 20, 20 feet, and it's still 30 some odd ohms of resistance. So any ground rod that they have on a house, and you were talking about getting electrocuted at the plates and, and things, setting the charge. I have a deep earth ground rod in, in my Faraday, for my Faraday cage. And it goes down 100 feet. And yeah, in so, Florida, yeah, they, so you don't have to worry about that. I mean, uh, my my water table is about 18 inches under the surface of the dirt, and there's sulfur in it, and an enormous amount of iron. Um, so my ground rods, you know, I've got an all steel building, and my ground rods go down six, eight, ten feet. Um, it, 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 the, the facility is fully grounded. The, the building is grounded. Everything's grounded. Um, no, that's not the problem. The problem is you you put a couple of uh, um, whatever it's micro coulombs or I don't know, I, Charlie handles all the numbers. You put a couple of, <laughs> you know, 4,000 volts at about two seconds worth of uh, current. Um, usually when we get a spark, we're getting uh, 100, 100 micro amps. Yeah, about 100 micro amps. That's all the power supply can put out. Um, but you, you, can, you can pack an awful lot of uh, charge onto a little bitty surface. And then it just never goes off and you because it's electrostatic. So there's nothing you can do about it at that point. Um, you just have to you know, I mean, if you're dissipate breakdown, it the next day. Drew, if you're having a breakdown, it'll be more than the output of the uh, uh, power supply because you're building up a capacitor, essentially, whatever you're charging. Yeah, we, we measure the current flowing into the system. We measure the current flowing out of the system. Um, we measure it going in and out um, two different ways. So we know exactly how much current's going through that system, and it 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 runs I'm out. I'm saying there. for the for the breakdown, not your system doesn't have breakdown voltages, right? It doesn't have. Uh, it's not breaking down on a regular basis. No, but mm -hmm. I mean we can we can see the sparks. You can see the the breakdown thing. You, it, we're we're I don't know. We're 250 cycles, or I think it records at 250 or 350 um, hertz. So you can clearly see the. The, the the spikes in voltage because on the on the output graph it's it's got thrust and uh, it's got the current that it draws normally and then you can see have you the, tried the a, a pulse DC yes yes we have we've tried AC we've tried pulse DC um, so that it doesn't matter which direction the 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 the, the uh, voltage is because it's it's electrostatic. There's there's a special uh, waveform. The problem isn't isn't voltage, guys. It's it's all about field. I mean, you can you can you can screw around with voltage all you want. Um, when you're in the DC land, it's all about field, and you get up around ten to the eighth volts per meter. And that's about it. And you can't you can't afford to make better vacuum or a vacuum good enough to uh, to stand up to much more than about ten to the eighth volts per meter. It's, it's just gonna, there, there's still ion, you know, there's still gas in that chamber. Um, I've, I've gone all the way down to 10 to the minus seven. And this, this thing still breaks down around 6,000 volts. And it's, that's about 10 to the eighth volts per meter. That's about it. Um, so that's why we wanna switch to meta materials and direct contact so that we don't have any gas between them. Well, and that's why we wanna, well, I got how about excited oxide about that. Layers? Oh, well, that's that, that's that's the magic, you know. I I love to get a hold of a piece of this uh, alien spaceship, you know. I've got a. I mean, that's what we're building. I've got a world class uh, SEM. I'd like to throw that thing in, um, but you know, uh, don't actually have a little piece uh, of alien spaceship. Drew, make nice to Linda Moulton Howell. Yeah, I got Charlie on that. Does he it? says he knows her. <laughs> She doesn't have it anymore. Yeah, I know Nick Pope. He said he, they gave it to uh, TTSA, who oh, gave it to uh, the, the, army. Military, the army uh, under a contract. Uh, uh, that piece doesn't exist anymore. But we're trying to replicate it over here. Um, yeah, well, I'm trying to replicate it too. So we, we, we need to stay in contact. 
Um, Definitely. The yeah. problem is there's so little. I mean, we, we we took a look at the picture and I threw it up and I zoomed it in and you know I I measured how thick the the materials were and I I know how many microns each one of the materials is in thickness, but you don't know what it really is. You don't know if there's an oxide layer between them. It could just I be metal on metal on metal. There could also be. Uh, we're looking at the side. There could be a another pattern when you like you turn it horizontal. I agree that, that you know. And all the, but, but the guy that's saying, teaching me how to do um, vapor deposition, because I mean, I've done telescope mirrors for 25 years, but this is deposition on a whole nother layer. This guy makes diamond for a living. Um, so, you know, we, we've, got the, we've got the ability to actually lay down diamond um, on select materials. It, it's very hot. But um, he's telling me that, that bismuth is a nightmare to deposit. He says, it's just, you just, you might as well just give up on that before you even start. Aqueous. No, I think the, the way is aqueous. There's um, that damn company. You mean know. just a chemical deposition and evaporate away yeah, the liquid? Yeah, you start, yeah, you do your, like your, hmm. your sub, your mask, your, your mother metal, the, the mother substrate, then pull it out, put it in an aqueous solution, let it sit there for a bit, pull it out, do another Oh, that's there interesting. Is, so basically, for, it's a combination of vapor deposition and and, and other forms of deposition. I, yeah, on our <coughs> planet, uh, in our technology on our planet, yeah, I think yeah. so. But aqueous to me, I is thought the, about that. Is my um? Yeah, because he says uh, uh, he says magnesium is a nightmare. Or yeah, or? yes, yeah. It's, is it magnesium, one of the one of the two. No, uh, the uh, tin. Is it tin? We zinc. Thank that. you. It's whatever's in brass. Um, okay. He said the copper is easy. It's the zinc that that just just, just trashes your uh, vapor deposition system. So, you know, I don't know. This guy's got forty years experience doing this nonsense. Yeah. Um, so I'm just I'm just learning about the exotic metals. But it he said that uh, bismuth is a tape. nightmare. I don't know. We'll cover it with some masking tape or something to uh, keep the chamber clean. Well, the uh, problem with using masking tape is that it's an aqueous base adhesive, and you'll never get you'll never get the outgassing to stop. So you definitely want to be using like uh, Kapton uh, adhesive or Kapton tape with uh, probably silicone adhesive because that stuff also comes with acrylic adhesive, and that never stops outgassing. So, I mean, there's, there are materials that are that are certainly far more vacuum compatible than. Um, anything's better than masking tape uh, or anything's better than um, like uh, black electrical tape. That's it. That, that's terrible. You'll, that'll never stop outgassing. That'll contaminate everything. So. Okay, how about just aluminum foil just mechanically held? Yeah. Place? Yeah. That, that's, you know, metals are wonderful things in vacuum. They don't outgas. Um, but again, you you need to wipe everything down with reagent grade um, alcohol or acetone, um, because uh, otherwise you're going to leave a film behind. Yep. And uh, man, I did enough telescope mirrors to tell you it doesn't take nothing, because the the vapors that the when you do vapor deposition, that vapor is about two thousand degrees Fahrenheit, and it's you know moving a mile a second, you know coming out of that crucible. So anything it hits, it transfers its thermal energy to as it turns back into a solid. And you, you'll vaporize any form of, of hydrocarbon that's on that surface. It'll just, it'll just turn into soot. And then you'll be basically freezing your metal on top of soot on top of your surface. Okay. So you'll that get just makes flaking everybody sad. Flaking and... Yeah, that's what that's yeah, that's what causes telescope. That's why the little tape test after you do a telescope mirror, you put the little piece of scotch tape on there or whatever it is, and you pull it up. And if the aluminum comes off, you know, then you get to strip everything back off and be sad and get it all clean again and try over. Wow. Much wow. to learn we have. <laughs> yeah. Right right now we're we're just getting our first vacuum down. I think we're getting uh close to the negative six right now. So would, he's just saying use lots of lots of alcohol and yeah. not the not the kind you guys not the stuff from the not the hardware store stuff. Oh, yeah, the real. I've been yeah. I mean, I've been chiming in on that, Mark. And yeah, stuff. we have a chemical store nearby. We'll stop by on Monday and see what they have. Yeah, they have, they, they you know, like I said, Fisher Scientific and 
Um, as long as you don't live within 50 miles of a port and order a whole bunch of different chemicals, then you don't even get visited by the um, Department of Homeland Security. Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you do live within 50 miles of a port and order a bunch of vacuum equipment. You do get visited by the Department of Homeland Security. How long have you had a vapor deposition machine for? Uh, probably 20 years now. Um, oh, that was for to, the telescopes. Yeah, for the telescopes. Yeah, I've, the, the new system has been, I don't know, probably six months. Um, had a lot of problems with it because I bought it all secondhand and just had a lot of problems with it. But um, yeah, vapor deposition is a, is a nightmare. Um, have you, have you, have, I don't know if that system, I can't tell what it is, but does it have uh, plasma cleaning? It's a Denton. It's a Denton 502A. So, okay. um, plasma cleaning, basically it's, it's like a, uh, 15,000 volt set of little, little things like this. You turn it on and pff, the whole chamber goes purple and you just, you just generate a plasma and it just basically incinerates any organics in the, in the chamber. Probably not. No, it doesn't. Oh. Okay. Uh, just That's kind of a last ditch effort for getting surfaces clean is to plasma clean them. Okay. It just has uh, two heating elements, or two feeding rods, high current. Um, it has a rotating center plate and uh, a, 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 like a blocker. You know, mm -hmm. That sounds that. pretty rudimentary. Is that the one you bought at Walmart online? Yeah, actually, no, it was, there, there's a warehouse down here in New Jersey, Bid Services, they had a whole bunch of them and they know how to service them as well. I'm just teasing you, man. I'm just messing with you. I, I bet Walmart does, let, let me check, Walmart Vapor Deposition System. Yeah, no. you'd be amazed how tough it is to get an actually operational Vapor Deposition System put together. Oh, the, this is- I, I give full credit, man. Are, those things are probably north of 10 grand to put, put a yeah. system together that works. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's working. It's working straight out of the box, too. Yeah. Um, I was just running outside, checking on the chiller. It's very hard to uh, control the temperature for the, um, the water, for the vacuum pump, the fusion pump. But we should be down oh, That thing has a diffusion pump? Yeah. Oh, make sure you got some, uh, uh, 70, uh, some Dow 701 oil in there. 704, I can't remember. The 704 this, we have. Yeah. The stuff that doesn't explode. That is very, very real. I don't know what you know about diffusion pumps, but that's another word for fuel air bomb. Okay. That is very, very, very serious stuff. Do not use straight mineral oil in a diff pump. Yeah, you get oxygen in there, you're going to wish you hadn't. Because, you know, diff pumps operate about 500 degrees above the uh, detonation te temperature of the oil in them. So... We're going to be using uh, oxygen afterward, but not when the pump is, uh, the valve will be closed. At that yeah, you point. better, yeah, you have, you, yeah, I promise you that the fireball will, will definitely change your attitude. Yeah, I lit one up once. It was, it was a very bad day. That's when I switched one? over to, to turbo pumps. At some point you realize that your, your life is worth more than um, the money that you waste on turbo pumps. We have a turbo pump in the other room. It needs a uh, controller, though. They all do. And they, yeah, the controllers keep burning out. I actually found a guy. He had some. He had some Edwards. I can't remember which ones they are, but they're big, uh, big nineteen or an eighteen or nineteen inch diameter monsters, and like six hundred pound turbo pumps. But they're the they were the engineering spares to the uh, Hadron Collider. You know, they got thousands of these turbo pumps over there, these giant Edwards. And this guy, I don't know where he stole them from. He had a whole bunch of them, new in the box. It was amazing. I bought a couple of those things. Oh, my God. You fire up a turbo pump, you know, an 18-inch throat on it. You just watch the pressure in the chamber go boom. I mean, I dropped five orders of magnitude in 15 minutes. Wow. It take, well, that's how long it takes the turbo pump to spin up. It'll drop at five orders of magnitude. It's, wow, it is impressive. That's crazy. Yeah. But with, uh, with budgets like the Large Hadron Collider, there's a lot of uh, spending that goes awry. They, they buy spare parts, don't need it. Oh, yeah. I mean, they have thousands of these Edwards turbo pumps. And, you know, they, I guess they cycle them out or they, th these were extras or whatever they were. Um, 
and it, they, they were still ridiculously expensive. Um, the, the ones I bought, it was pointlessly expensive, but it's worth it. <laughs> you push the button and you are rewarded with, you know, high vacuum every time. And when your goal is to, you know, set up and, and, and run a test before you go to work in the morning, um, you want the stupid thing to work. You don't want to be arguing with it. And diff pumps are just, they're just too scary. I have used them for years and they're just all terrifying. How much, so how much did you pay for the turbo pumps? How much do those um, things cost? They're about 30,000 a piece. Wow. Yeah. It's about is... a third of what they would cost now. They're about, they're about 90 grand for these monsters. So, oh, wow. And it's a fifth of the vacuum. It's a, it's a, uh, no, not a fifth. This is probably the, the volume of the turbo is probably about an eighth of the entire chamber. So the chamber is only about seven or eight times the volume of the turbo pump. So when you switch on a turbo pump that big on a chamber that small, and the chamber is only, I don't know, 30 inches in diameter and maybe 40 inches long or something like that. Um, you switch on a turbo pump that big, it's, it's, it, it's instant magic. You know, it's, it's just, it's just happiness. And then I operate from, you know, it's Florida. So I have, you know, 95% humidity and, you know, I don't have it in the shop isn't air conditioned. Um, Cause it's just a waste heat is just so horrendous. Um, so it, I gotta, I gotta overcome the molecular moisture every single time. It takes a couple hours to really, really get it down. I mean, I can test it. I don't know. I can test it at two times 10 to the minus five in about 20 minutes, or I can let it pump for the, you know, sit next six hours and it's down at 10 to the minus six, you know, two to the 10 to the minus six. So, so what materials have you uh, successfully deposited so far? Aluminum. Because, you know, I was really good at depositing aluminum on mostly on silicon uh on glass oh for lenses right yeah, yeah. for telescope mirrors yeah so we, we should really, definitely uh keep in really really good for, at that because we're, we're gonna play around with uh bismuth uh you know we're gonna play around with some of the hard ones yeah you want to start with some of the easy ones like nickel you know? i mean right now the machine is full of gold so maybe we'll just do gold, gold is easy yeah gold is, a, is that's real easy to vapor deposit um we, we um actually uh um, our experiments, we, we had a lot of problems with the magnesium when we were using just magnesium plates. Um, we use uh, uh, copper coated Kapton for all the, the, the flexi stuff, but the, um, the secondary plates were all just um, usually brass, but I went crazy and tried a whole bunch of different metals and, and the, the light stuff, it like aluminum and, and magnesium and um, some of the super lighter weight materials. I didn't have anything super dangerous. Um, it just, it just, it just sputtered. You know, you put four or 5,000 volts on it and it just sputters away to nothing. So we couldn't even use that to make thrust. Um, so we gave up on all that stuff and just stuck with brass because it's real friendly. Um, and the nickel worked really well too. That was kind of amazing. So. Have you tried making oxide layers as your, uh, as your uh, dielectric? No, because we don't really use a dielectric. Um, we use vacuum as the dielectric, essentially. You know, the, the only thing I would want to do is I would want to replace vacuum with an oxide layer of some kind or some magic um, that gets me down to the same one uh, permittivity or less. I mean, I would love to figure out some way to, you know, crank out one tenth permittivity um, and some sort of magical oxide layer that generates a tenth of a of a, of a permittivity, we you know. Zinc or, oxide and cryogenics, you know. Mm, I saw zinc oxide makes super high permittivity, um, like in the hundreds, but I didn't see it where, it, I maybe, mean, I don't yeah, know if it, I saw it in the cryogenic realm. Yeah, there's an article written about zinc oxide in the cryogenic realm becomes a super resistor or super insulator. Yeah, that would be high permittivity. That would be something that I don't know. I have to look into that again. I thought I I thought I looked into that once. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, 
I'm taking a so anyhow um guys this is great but um in florida it's uh three hours later in the day than it is for you and i have a test to run see this is the, this is the coolness that was yesterday and we're in the millinewton range for thrust so i'm going to go and run my test which takes about 20 minutes and call it a night okay drew if you want to get in contact with me uh just respond to the email that you got the invite from that goes directly to my email Okay. I'll turn yeah. it to you now. Yeah, it'd be great to go offline and, and discuss this madness. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're getting into a level of technicality that's boring people out. <laughs> make, make sure uh, myself or Tom, who's, who's present with Mark when we're doing this, Mark needs a backup on some of this. So. Sure. Yeah. Okay, guys. Well, it's been a blast. Uh, good luck. Thank you, Drew. you. Figure Thank out you. some way to make shit float, man. Let me know. Spin waves. It's all about those spin waves. Spin waves. Yes. Yeah, so many spin waves. Oh, look, look <laughs> Good luck. That. All right. Hey, David. I have a question for you. I saw your website. You had the section on interferometers. Um, I've mentioned the experiment called the SAGNAC experiment. It's out there. There's been confusing issues concerning the controversy of results of uh, result of experiments. Have you heard anything or read anything about them? What your opinion of those? Um, no, I'm, you know, I, I hate to say this, but, you know, uh, we're kind of confined in a in a vacuum, <laughs> we uh, uh, concentrating on you know what we're doing, and I find that although everything that you guys are talking about is very very interesting, that I can get contaminated pretty easily in my thoughts way. So I try to keep focused on on what we're doing and where we're trying to achieve. Yeah. So I'm sorry to say I can't make comments on. I'm in the same position. There's so much interesting stuff in APEC. I can't gather them all in. I have to choose what I want to get into. You know, I just stick with what I can do, and that's 3D model. Well, you know, I should also mention that um, Phil Bouchard wanted to do a presentation also. If you guys want to, if you want to have Phil on now, if, if he's still here. Let's walk around. There he is. Phil, 